Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the council meeting for the 13th of October 2021. And to open our meeting, could I ask uh, Councillor Kidu to open it? Thank you. Kia ora tātou. Ka nui te aroha ki o kōtsa. Kei rata kōra wai aroha o tō tātou uru ki a uruhaiti. Tēnā kōtsau, tēnā kōtsau, kia ora tātou katoa. E te atu e kaha rawa. Kei te whaka mōi mi ti mātou ki a koe e tēnei rā. Nā mai haro mai kai wāngi o tātou ki te whaka nui tō tātou. Whānau, te iwi te hapū, te hapuri o tātou. A nei rā, e te atua, a nei rā, te wānanga o heimo i a tātou, ki te whakatū tō tātou kōrero heimo i a tātou. Nō rere e te atua, tēnā tibihi aro ki a koe, a tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Kia ora kata. Thank you, Bernie. Kia ora, Robert. Thank you. So, welcome to councillors, welcome to members of the public that may be in the council foyer and those watching online. Um, we have members of the priests present as well, officers. Um, nice to have you with us. Um, so we have no apologies. Uh, we have no public participation. Um, just want to advise that we do have a late item which will be um, in can, um, relation to the Foxton Community Board uh, resignation of Ms Newland, which do, we do have to accept a resolution that we accept her resignation, but that will come up following uh, the report from the Foxton Community Board. Um, declarations of interest. Yes, Your Worship. Um, please, 9.1, um, in my emergency management role, I will so have that uh, item. So noted. Thank you. No one else? Right, um, Ross. Confirmation of minutes. Um, so, could I move that these minutes be uh, confirmed as a true and correct record, which are the meeting minutes from the Council Open and In Committee from the 8th of September 2021? Councillor Allen, seconded Councillor Isaacs. So all those in favour? Against, carried. And also um, that the minutes of our extraordinary meeting of Council 29th of September 2021 be confirmed as a true and correct record. Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Allen, all those in favour? Against, carried. Thank you. Announcements. We have the um, Chair of the Foxton Community Board with us. So welcome, David, and um, look forward to your report. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, a little bit to report. We uh, carried out our um, breakfast with the FTDA, uh, Foxton Community Board, and the CCT Camera Trust. Um, well attended, but one of the things that came out from that meeting was that was a lot of people couldn't make it in the morning and would like to request a meeting in the afternoon. So we have actually organised another meeting on the 4th of November well, after five o'clock, so those that can't make it in the morning will find schedule in for an evening meeting. Um, I believe the planting day at Fox and Beach was very successful. There was a request on the audit paper that um, to look into, um, made by one of our board members, relating to vehicles entering the dunes. After all that planting, they were concerned about the vehicles, so that's I'm getting a report from uh, officers with about garden that. Um, we got a workshop, we had a workshop regarding the Holden Reserve and the officers are coming back to the next board meeting and they're going to let us tell us what we can get done prior to Christmas, so we're looking forward to that, see what can be done. Uh, the money's there, it's a time frame. And then I'm also looking forward to the Regional Council presentation and plan consulting with the Foxton people on the East Drainage Scheme. Now, they tell me they had some video links relating to that. I was trying to get into it, but all I could get was pictures and no sound, so I'll have to take a verbal meeting instead. But that's about where we are at the moment, and more to report back to the next board meeting. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Chair David. 
Any questions? Thanks, Just a quick question um, regarding page 11, 3.5 around the Manawatu Estuary Viewing Platform. Is there an update on that or is it still, are we still waiting? I see from the report that's come to the board meeting that they had a meeting with um, some of the residents along there and a meeting with Iwi and those that haven't been um, being on the circular, we'll pick up the circular, they're going to do a white face meeting with them. Just, yeah. So that's in the report, in the next report. All right, thank you. Councillor Tukupu. Thank you. I'm not sure if this question is for Mr. Roach or maybe David. And that is, um, did you receive further clarification around our decision to reduce um, the funding for Forbes Road subdivision and just um, from memory at least it was because we weren't going to be the developer. All right, that is on the audit paper. I've actually asked that question at the last board meeting. Why was it removed? Has the board have no had no indication or no knowledge of what's going on, and why there's only seven hundred odd thousand, I think it is, still on the budget, something like that. And that was a question, and I think the officers are going to come back to us with an explanation. Or it was asked of councillors, but nobody gave us an explanation. Um, but I think Mr. Clappenden is going to give us an insight of what's going on. Think, does that help or not? Well, after the next board meeting, I will certainly be able to tell you. Uh, there will be an update to the community board at uh, next week's community board meeting. Um, thank you, uh, David. So, um, just moving to the receipt of the uh, Foxton Community Board Minutes, um, 2.1 on page 7, uh, that the report be received. Could I have a move and a second? Councillor Branning and Councillor Allen. All those in favour? Right. Against, carried. Thank you. So, uh, we do have 2.4, the recommendation, but we have added to that. Um, and it's just... Um, Oh, see, the Chief Executive will read them. So there is three suggested resolutions that we would add to uh, this report. Um, the first one being that Council accepts the resignation of Ms Nori Newland from the Fox and Community Board from Friday 15th of October 2021. Second one is that Council writes to Ms, Ms. Newland thanking her for her contribution for the contribution she has made to the Foxton Community Board and the Foxton and Foxton Beach Townships. That council, and the third one being that council does not fill the vacancy on the Foxton Community Board as a result of Ms Newland's resignation due to, the, to there being 12 months or less before the triennial election in 2022. Councillor Jennings. Um, just a question to the Chief Executive around um, his awareness or understanding of some uh, legislation that's been um, uh, put forward by the government around um, essentially enabling uh, that election date next year to be extended out into 2023, potentially for COVID-related uh, reasons. But there doesn't seem to be a corresponding um, provision that would uh, enable uh, or to deal with this type of situation where, um, because it's 12 months to the election, we've made a decision not to fill it. So, uh, so that might just be something that um, I don't, you might want to be aware of and we might want to feed back through to uh, relevant um, authorities because it, it, it could end up, there could end up being a sort of unintended consequence. Um, I noted, and I wasn't aware of that, and, but I think um, if that is the case, um, I would, we've got to assume that status quo prevails until 
the legislation changes. But if the legislation changes, um, we would need to be um, aware of the uh, ensuring that what we've decided today is actually um, uh, still prevails um, if the legislation does change next year. But um, assumption is that status quo prevails today. Are you aware of the date that that law may be enacted, or is it just discussion at this stage? I'll come back to you in about two seconds. Um, so the recommendations are on the table. Could I have a mover and a seconder for those, please? Deputy Mayor Mason, Councillor Kenny Simmons. Any debate or discussion? All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Moving to the proceedings of the Community Funding and Recognition Committee of the 15th of September 2021. Uh, move 2.1, that the uh, report be received. Um, moved Councillor Tukapua and seconded Councillor Jennings. 2.1, uh, 2.2, sorry. And then we have, uh, could I put that, then, that motion? Uh, all those in favour? against carried, and 2.3, that the Horofana District Council ratifies the following round one 2021-2022 community grant allocations. Do I have a mover and a seconder for that recommendation, please? Councillor Jennings, Councillor Allen, any discussion? Councillor Mitchell? Uh, yeah, in the past, I seem to recall that there used to be a list of everybody that applied for the grants, not just the people that actually, or organisations that were given them. And I was wondering why that's changed, that we can't actually see who applied and wasn't successful through the minutes that follow this um, recommendation. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, to be honest, I don't know of any reason as to why that has changed other than it's obviously dropped off a process. Um, I myself am not aware that that used to come through. If that's something of interest to Council, we can definitely apply that to come back through if that is a mechanism that Council has previously been used to. I'd obviously be looking to some guidance also from the committee as to whether they are supportive of that action. Councillor Allen. Could, could I move that that matter be referred to the committee to consider? I can see some implications both ways on that. So I move that it be referred to the Grants Funding Committee. You'll move, um, you're happy with that, Councillor Marshall? Thank you. So Julie noted that that item will go back to the uh, committee to uh, discuss and bring back and adjust uh, minutes if needed. Any further um, discussion or clarification? I'll therefore put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Moving to the proceedings of the Finance Audit and Risk Committee from the 29th of September 2021. Uh, could I move 2.1, 2.2 that these minutes be received? Uh, Councillor Isaacs. Seconded Councillor Allen. All those in favour? Thank you. Against carried. Now to uh, reports. Um, the mayoral report for uh, September 2021, um, which you can see has been a very uh, busy month dominated by discussion around three waters and representation review. Could I move receipt of that report? Uh, could I have a seconder? Councillor Kay Simmons, thank you. All those in favour? Any further additions or questions on the report? Councillor Tukapur. Oh, I just wondered, and happy to uh, receive this off one, um, the, there's a few meetings there um, around entity seniors, and could we get a little down on that? So the... Um, 
entity C is the region that uh, Horofnu has been included in as the prospective area for um, the Three Waters reforms. Um, so we're known as entity C, which represents 22 different um, territorial authorities across that entity. So all um, to try and get a not a uniform uh, or consensus response, um, they decided to meet and discuss common issues and the way, you know, what the thoughts were around different things. Exactly what we did in terms of providing our feedback uh, individually. It wasn't, uh, it was an addition to that, but by no means represented individual council's views. Councillor Bishop. Thank you. I, I just note here under the catch up with the MP, um, and I'm not sure about the timing of that meeting and the decision or the resolution we've made as far as this council's position on the three waters. Um, can you give us an update, please, around what the discussion, if indeed you did discuss the three waters with the MP and, and uh, what you uh, laid on her as far as our position and what the response was, please? So I do have a regular catch up. Um, each month with our MP. This was recently early in the month, so it wasn't. It was before a lot of the council discussion around uh, our positive feedback. But we recognised that there were a number of concerns um, that um, they were becoming aware of at the time. But nothing. Um, she was well aware of um, the pushback and the um, discussion that was evolving at the time. But nothing concrete. No. Um, I also see that there are at least three meetings to do with the weed harvester for Lake Horofino, and I just wondered if you could give us an update about what's happening with that. And yeah, please. Sure. Um, so the weed harvester was in danger of not proceeding due to um, some funding shortfall, um, and. Horizons held a council meeting where they discussed uh, adding to their budgets to enable the wheat harvester to get onto the lake this season. Uh, because if it didn't, if that budget wasn't approved, then it would have to wait another year before the harvester actually got onto the lake. Um, we submitted to that um, uh, discussion and um, pleased to say that uh, the Horizons councillors approved um, adding to the budget of some significant amount of $233,000. Um, and from what I understand, um, the work is underway and the, lead, the weed harvester is either on the water or about to be launched. Councillor Tukapu. I'll just subsequent to my earlier question around the entity seniors meeting. Um, you mentioned the 22 and uh, something of a consensus. Can you report what what was reached? I mean, is, was there a split? If I haven't already, and I'm pretty sure I have, um, sent you the uh, the, um, the outcome of that. Um, but I, if, if not, I'll find it and forward it to you all. It's only a one-page document, basically which reflects, at a lower level, our concerns of what we submitted back to the government. Councillor Allen. I, I come back to the question raised by Councillor Bishop uh, about liaising with our local MP over the three waters, noting that time is running out and the decision is probably quite imminent on that. Um, I, I believe it would be appropriate, Mr Mayor, respectfully to us that you do represent directly to our local MP the strength of feeling around the three waters. One of the phrases used during the debate time and time again was about local voice and the potential loss of local voice. She is our local voice on this issue and I believe it would be appropriate for this council through you to meet with her and urge her to represent our views very strongly to the Minister prior to any decision being made. Thank you for that. And I am uh, scheduled to catch up with her on Friday, so I will pass that on. Councillor Kaysons. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, just an opportunity for some information sharing. So last Thursday, I attended the Regional Interagency Network meeting up in Palmerston North, and we had two informative presentations, one being around SIQ, which is the Supervised Isolation and Quarantine, which is community-based isolation and quarantine of contacts and cases regarding COVID. It's home-based, so usual place of residence will apply. It's supported with wraparound welfare services. Um, it also might mean, in some cases, alternative accommodation. So the wraparound services are health, welfare and wellbeing, daily checks, financial food, cultural support, transport, primary care, and the psycho-social services. So we've invited this particular presenter, who is Joanne Ransom, to our next Community Wellbeing Committee, which is Tuesday the 9th of November, to present. We also heard from Dr Billinghurst, who presented on behalf of Mid-Central Health District Board. This was around supporting the final COVID-19 vaccination push, reaching the last 30%. I do have his presentation available if elected members would like it sent through to them. It contains a lot of answers to questions from the public. Um, also regarding RINs is that they've also refreshed their terms of reference and are focusing on their priority area work plans for achieving better outcomes for Tararua, Horofenua, Marutu and Palmerston North. So in future, members attending this network forum will be the regional and district managers. It will not be delegated reps unless they have delegated authority to make decisions and commitments of their own organisations. So that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, and regarding Community Wellbeing Committee, our individual meetings with stakeholders of this particular committee have started and we are making some pretty good progress and we should be able to get through everyone by the end of October. We are focusing on the current topics of their interest, the five networks and how they report to community wellbeing, presenters, keynotes and speakers, as well as workshops and the community wellbeing membership in the meeting format currently. Um, also, how we can ensure that the community wellbeing meetings continue to hold value and what community wellbeing format has worked well now and in the past. So, thanks. Thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak to that? Okay, have I moved with voted on receiving that report, Karen? Yes. Okay, moving to the monitoring report. Uh, could I move uh, receipt of that report? Councillor K. Simmons, seconded Councillor Mitchell. All those in favour? Against? Carried? Any items that members wish to bring? Councillor Jennings. Yeah, just a point of clarification on um, item number 21 bar 355, which is titled there, Localised Flooding Event Response Debrief Report. So I just, I just wanted to clarify, I think um, the, at the previous meeting there was a, a, a report on the, the localised flooding, and then the report uh, in this agenda is around specifically the water treatment uh, issues. And so um, I, I'm, I think I'm sort of one of the causes of, 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 uh, of that coming on to, to this agenda. But I just wanted to flag that there is a question um, around uh, both of those reports refer to contingency plans. And so one of the things I'll be doing today is just asking some clarifying questions to make it clear about what's actually meant across those two reports, just, just to put that beyond doubt. Um, but in terms of this monitoring report, I think that I'd be happy to move that we remove this, or, or does that just automatically happen? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it does happen. Thank you for that. And your questions will be looked forward to when we get there to that report. Any other? Okay, moving to the Chief Executive's report to the 1st of October. Uh, could I move that the report be received? Councillor Allen, um, seconded Councillor Brannigan. All those in favour? against carried. So there are uh, a number of different uh, recommendations in this report. Um, but first, are there any questions for the Chief Executive on the contents of the report? Yeah. 
There being none, uh, so let's move to uh, 2.3 and 2.4 and 2.5. Uh, 2.3 being that the Horrifinder District Council adopts the attached meeting schedule for Council, the Finance Order and Risk Committee and Community Wellbeing Committee for the period January to December 2022. Should, oh, yeah. And the council notes that additional ordinary, extraordinary and multi-day meetings may be scheduled from time to time in consultation with the Mayor and Chief Executive. And 2.5, that meeting times for other committees and subcommittees will be formally notified when they are required in accordance with the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act 1987 and Local Government Act 2002. Moved Councillor Allen, seconded Deputy Mayor Mason. Any discussion? There being none, put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. So now moving to 2.6, that the Horofanua District Council approves to move 470,000 from the major toilet renewal budget in year three of the long-term plan to year two, uh, 2022 to 2023 of the long-term plan. A mover and a seconder. So this relates to item 3.2 in the report. Councillor Allen moving. Uh, Councillor Tukapua seconding. Any discussion or clarification? <laughs> Councillor Tukapua. Uh, yes, the, um, like, obviously I note that there'll be a um, you know, the construction of a, a plant alongside this and so that there's one building instead of two and I understand the whole point about um, shutting it once for construction rather than twice and um, not to interrupt our users too much. But I guess on the on the surface it looks like a lot of money for a tool. How, how um, are we... Are we comfortable if um, the project steering group gets, uh, I guess, uh, monitors a bit closer than, say, the rest of us? Sorry, through you, um, Worship. I, I think that's actually a fair call to um, have um, the um, outline of what's been proposed um, as far as the development that. Uh, Jubilee Park come through the project steering group, um, group and that will, could occur over the next uh, eight, eight or so months before we actually get into the next year. Happy with it? Yep. Cool. So I'll now put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. And now 2.7. Um, that the Horofana District Council adopts the subsidised e-waste recycling proposal. Do I have a move? Councillor Kay Simmons. Seconded, Councillor Allen. Any debate or discussion further to the report that's on page 39? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Against, carry. Thank you. Right. Just um, to move now to uh, page 41, which is our draft for a climate change action plan. Um, could I move 3.1, 3.2, uh, that this report be received? Deputy Mayor Mason, seconded Councillor Mitchell. All those in favour? Against carried. So now, um, any discussion or debate on the uh, endorsement of the action plan? Councillor Mitchell. Um, have we got time for questions? Yeah. Have we got an officer that prepared the report to talk to him? 
I'll, I'll try and answer the questions. Oh, okay. I've just had a, a few things that I wondered about. Um, my first question was that when we um, decided that we would join this Horizons Regional Council Territorial Authority group, um, we had that motion that we moved that, that it had to be unanimous to have any changes applied, and I was just wondering, did that happen? So you see here number four in the background information. And we recommend to the Joint Climate Action Committee that the word unanimous be included in the variations to this agreement before any amendments could be made. And I was just wondering whether that had been passed or not with that group. No, not as yet. Um, the next meeting is due in month, next month, yes. Okay, I th that was ages ago. I thought that was right at the beginning that we decided to. So this um, is very much still in the uh, formation stages of this uh, joint committee. In fact, it was only the last meeting that we, we signed off the, the membership of the committee um, and things like that. So there is still a lot of work to do in terms of the formation and, and what happens um, to that committee. Uh, but now that you've noted and picked up on that, I'll make sure that that um, is put into the, any discussion. Thank you. So I just had a few questions. So I, I just wondered, um, does, does Horizons have detailed modelling and data to back up what's happening in our district that would be available for the public? Um, or even elected members to actually look at, to, to back up what's happened? Um, yeah, so Horizons, they have commissioned talk and um, to carry out a uh, risk, uh, re regional risk assessment um, work uh, for that. That does not include the detailed uh, modelling as such. Um, However, it does include um, quite lots of, um, uh, I, I, I suppose, aspects, and then there has been some sort of um, social pinpoint engagement uh, with, with the committee across the region. That was the first step, and I guess from 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 this, uh, like after this phase, there might be there might be further work. Uh, and um, like further work will be done by individual, I guess, by individual councils, by the individual TIs. I'm happy to let you carry on. Um, so my next question was, or just, just when I read the report, sometimes you had little numbers that took you down to the evidence, like it might have been the report from NIWA that um, established that there might be a 0.8 metre sea level rise by 2100. I was just wondering if it would be possible to put hyperlinks in the digital document so that people could actually go straight to that evidence and actually see it for themselves um, and I was wondering whether that was because sometimes they have low medium or high sort of ranges and was that 0.8 low medium or high or is there only one form of modeling? So what we can do on our uh, on our website and also maybe uh, in here as well um, is to put a link to that um, risk assessment carried out by Tonkin and Taylor. Um, so that can be done and that's actually available, I suppose, I need to check, I need to double check if that's possibly available on the Horizons website. Yeah. Thank you. And um, my next question was, well, was page four of the document, which is 45 of the um, agenda. Bullet point two talks about a sustainability policy I was wondering if you could explain a bit more what you mean by that. So, 
what I what we mean by that is to uh, at the moment there isn't there isn't anything, and that will be let's say a um, that will uh, that will be a part, like part of a roadmap uh, for what is needs to be done across the across the organisation, and also um, also within the committee if they do have if they do have influence. So that will provide us some sort of roadmap. So um, that will entail, um, let's say, um, carbon uh, stock take um, within, within the organization. Um, and that will also provide uh, what areas do we need to focus on. For example, um, uh, let's say in some areas, uh, but in part of the organisations, we do have um, high energy users or um, um, that sort of stuff. So when we when we are uh, doing project scoping, we can look at how we can uh, decrease that. And also in the case of uh, like um, during the planning phase, uh, district plan, or um, during the um, Project um, scoping phase that we can look into um, look into ways to um, reduce the uh, uh, environmental impact um, and, and climate change uh, impact. And also we need to bear in mind that 2050 uh, there's a there's a target in there by the government that we all need to do our bit to reduce our emissions. And that's across all sector. Council question. Oh, I've got another question, so. I'll keep going. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So just one thing on page 49 and changes to our district. I just wondered whether salt water intrusion and rising water tables was something that you had to consider that it's to do with sea level rises but it doesn't seem to be measured, mentioned anywhere in the document. And the other thing that I just wanted to talk about was um, the timeline which August to November is engagement and we're now almost in the middle of October. Um, is it engagement or consultation? And has anything occurred so far, and if so, with who? So I'll answer that. Um, uh, whilst this um, document was prepared um, um, a few months ago now, um, one of the things that I've had to consider is actually how we resource this, and we just do not have the capacity to do some of the things that have been um, identified um, in the action plan. Um, we will have to recalibrate the time frame um, uh, and as far as the actions that have been identified, and I think we've also got to link it to the work that Horizons Regional Council are already doing and the governance group. Uh, but just to note, I don't have capacity within the organisation at the moment to actually do some of the work that's been identified in the action plan. So we, we're going to have to push some of these things out. Uh, yeah, it's it will be engagement here. So we need to have meaningful enga engagement with with the with the community and the and affected um, sector. We got the council vision. Thank you. Um, before my questions, I think last week we learned from an officer from Horizons that there is some modelling um, that is that is already available. Um, can I ask that we get a copy of that? Yes. Yeah, we, we couldn't get an answer on the day as to what that morning said. Um, it would be nice to have that information. Um, <clears throat> so, Mr Chief Executive, you, you talk about the pressures and, and we might have to push some of this back. Um, question one is, who's driving the program, given that we're going to be forming a, a cross-TA committee? And you know we've got um, in the flowchart here uh, for council to adopt in December twenty one. Um, can we, given that 
you're saying we're not ready. Does the committee carry on um, with the with the planned work program and send it out as recommendations? I'm just very nervous, as you're all well aware, of what this piece of work could be signing us up for. And when do we, as a table, have input into what the appetite is for this district um, to have to consider some recommendations that potentially have already been very well canvassed and not set in some result, because that would be our position, I would hope. Um, but they're so far down the track that it's very hard to actually put a another view into that conversation. Um, where, where does that, where is the scope for that conversation to happen? Um, can I assure you that that has been raised by a number of us at the Joint Action Committee already, especially um, the smaller um, rural and provincial councils have um, made it well known that we don't have the resourceful capacity to be able to do a lot in this space. Um, I am due to attend a workshop next month, as as the um, so where further discussion and um, um, you know sort of I suppose scoping in terms of where this is going to land and how it will land um, to be done. I am pretty sure that we're not due to sign off any actual plan until well into next year. Um, probably not till the middle of next year, I think, is the plan. Uh, so there's quite a lot of work to be done to understand what an action plan may look like and um, what commitment, if any, that we might have. My, my biggest fear is that who's going to tell the residents of Fox and that we're retreating? I mean, that could be a genuine outcome if we are serious about believing the headline. And that's, this isn't going to be sorted out in three or six months, Mr. Mayor. There's no way that from this point where you've got a guy from Horizons who this is his baby, he's got the modelling, you can't tell me what the numbers are. You know, there's a lot of work to be done and there's a huge amount of implication that would flow down through every stream of, of strategic thinking, planning, delivery of our beach communities. And that's the red flag I'm raising and that's why I won't be supporting this. Thing. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Mason. Uh, thank you. And just following on from Councillor Mitchell's comments about page nine and the Horofana District Council sustainability policy, uh, we've got a waste minimisation policy that talks about sustainability and some of that work's already been done. So will that be referred to as part of this work or will that work not be duplicated and sit in isolation as another policy that doesn't link up? Um, so Okay, I'll answer that question. Uh, oh, okay. it, seems, it seems okay now, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, there is no, I mean, this Climate Change Action Plan is across all the organisation and, and goes beyond that. And whereas Waste Minimisation Management Plan is, is quite specific to that area. Yes, you're right, there will be some um, uh, crossover. Uh, and that will, and I mean, this uh, this is the same thing. What what's happening in other parts as well? Like there are there are activities that we are doing, and that's already going towards the um, climate change. Um, like in the case of looking uh, looking for an alternative water supply, so that's that falls under climate change. Um, in the case of with the wastewater um, uh, treatment. That falls under climate change. So there are quite lots of uh, things that we are already doing, and we are we have included those. Um, so what this does is to ensure that we are we do have holistic approach 
in this in this area, and we got a a bit more robust and um, a roadmap where we need to well, how we're going to get to that target. Jennings, is your microphone off? As yeah, well. it's, uh, deep um, try and stop talking. <laughs> um, look, one of the things that I am interested in is, is I guess, the elements that sit uh, alongside the plan, which is so that we talked about the sustainability policy and the emissions stock take. So, starting with the um, sustainability policy. I, I mean, I am sitting here sort of questioning its value at, at the moment, and the reason for that is, and, and I want to get sort of just sort of test this thinking with you, is that at the moment we already plan for the future and we think about what might be happening, what sort of extra um, um, uh, protections or safeguards we might need in terms of our infrastructure, right? So, and we do that through a long-term plan process. So we're already doing that thinking around potential impact of climate change at that point through through an LTP process. But then we also come along and we actually put a project in place and as part of that project planning, someone like, like Brent will go away and he will look at things like, um, you know, what's the what you know what's the energy that this is going to be using? You know, should we choose this or over this product because it's um, got, got better efficiency or, or, or those those kind of considerations are already built into our decision making and planning processes and so I'm just trying to understand in terms of the sustainability policy what more is it likely to add in terms of how we actually do that activity I think I think one of the feedback it was given to to the council through the council marks as well is to improve the climate change element um, in our LTP. Yes, in some areas it was it was done well, and some areas needed a bit more bit more work. Um, so um, there is there is there is there, I guess there is a small element, but what we what's this will drive is to make that that process happens robustly, um, and and we need, and we put a bit more emphasis um, in in that in that space. And also, like we are going through, we are going through uh, big growth in our, in our district, and um, and we need to look at all aspects. Um, so if you want to do, I guess, good planning and long-term planning, we need to have these, these incorporated in our, in our work streams. And we need to work with sector as well, private sector. I'll come back to you. Um, Councillor Kedu. Uh, yes. Um, I don't know who's going to answer this question, maybe David, might be for David. Just in terms of um, where are our iwi partners in, in terms of the policies that we try to and talk about, um, where are we at in terms of um, iwi partners? And because um, I'm thinking about um, Councillor Bishop when he's talking about you know um, some of the when are we as, as a council going to know to some of those details? I suppose that's why I'm wanting to know with um, Iwi, our part, Iwi partners as well. Um, Kats, Kedu, I can possibly answer that for you. Um, so this joint committee is definitely uh, a co-governance committee uh, with Iwi and um, the territorial authorities jointly uh, uh, as being members of this committee um, and in fact as co-chairs uh, Dr. Huhana Smith has been, was um, 
um, appointed as a co-chair at our last meeting, and she's representing Raukawa and uh, on that committee. But every uh, territorial authority has iwi representation on that committee, so there is um, equal numbers, if you like, in terms of um, how that, that this committee will form, and seems to be so far the initial stages seem to be working well. Councillor took a put. Just two questions. Uh, the first one, um, I guess I'm just double checking by endorsing the draft. Um, are we effectively committing to um, the detail in this, for example, on um, page 18 um, that says a couple times invest more, invest more? And I understand why it's it's for mitigation, it's for adaption, but um, like uh, Councillor Bishop mentioned earlier, we haven't actually had a chance to workshop our appetite around how, how much more quantifying. And when I hear um, our CEO talk about, well, we're lacking a resource just to meet some of this anyway, I, I, it's, it's not really making sense to me. So, um, resourcing the resourcing, uh, looking after this um, part portion of it. That's 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 what David is um, CEO is talking about. And um, page eighteen, um, one being invest more in shared pathways. And and while we have um, made room for that, now that there's this hanging in the balance, what are NZTA going to come back with after getting rejected? Well, we're yet to have that follow-up discussion, so I just I just want to be sure, you know, if we endorse it, how committed are we to those details if some of that stuff falls through? I can answer that. Um, so anything like this in terms of a, um, a strategy, I suppose, um, is, is one thing you can actually identify um, your desires and your um, aspirations. Um, there is a, another step in the process, and that's around the LTP or an annual plan, um, and that's a separate discussion that needs to be had to enable um, strategies. And quite often we get to a point where council decides, no, it doesn't have sufficient financial capacity um, to actually fund some things, but they do that at the time um, that the LTP or the annual plan is being considered. So this doesn't um, indicate that it's a fait accompli that budgets will become available um, for the work that's actually been identified. It, all it's saying is that, yes, there would be a desire to actually have more invested in X, Y and Z um, within the, the plan itself. But a decision would have to be confirmed by council as to what budget will be um, put um, against some of these things that have been identified. Uh, appreciate that. Um, I guess uh, I, I asked the question because in the past um, when we've had similar plans, uh, I, I recall it was either a community wellbeing one or, or some. It was related to Te Tāke Etanga o Kura Haupo, and um, there was some changes that uh, I guess a little bit um, missed by us in the detail. And then when we asked the question later, it was like, it was too late because you, you accepted that and so it just happened. So I, I, I don't know if others recall that, but we, we, we've missed some of this before and, and then we, oh, too late, okay. That's the Jennings. Just a question to the Chief Executive. Is it, is it an option to essentially park the plan that's on the agenda today and take a slightly different approach, which, one, which would be potentially developing a very slim plan that is based on things that we are already doing or that we've already committed resources or funding to do, so it's a very short-term focused plan, maybe it's 12 months or 18 months or something, 
um, and and so that we then have time to further develop what we want to do um, in terms of in terms of a, a plan, um, and that also then presumably buys us some time also to look at ha perhaps some of the other bigger councils in the joint committee structure and what they've done in terms of sustainability policies. Perhaps we can um, plagiarise the hell out of their policy and, and, and customise um, to us rather than starting from scratch. Uh, I mean, is that is that is that a realistic option or do we have obligations to the joint committee that we need to essentially follow the follow the format that's in front of us? So uh, just just to make uh, just to make it clear that this document does not commit council to 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 do um, let's say um, uh, commitment on the capital expenditure or opex capital expenditure that's outside the LTP. So when you actually look at it, most of this stuff that's listed there, they're already in the LTP. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to consolidate stuff that is what we are already doing and maybe some of the items that that we might, it, it may not be included in there, but we, we, are, we, are, uh, we are putting it in, in here or in the sustainable policy. Um, with these action plans, what it does and um, in if we don't have an action plan, that means we don't actually have any, um, um, any not quite the position. Um, let's say if regional uh, risk assessment identifies this needs to be done, and they might they will be going out for funding, you know, in, in getting possibly getting funding from the central government. So I'm, ju I'm just going to give you um, a little bit maybe um, what the national um, framework looks like for the climate change. So um, government already, um, uh, not signal, they already put in place that they are, uh, um, so there's a national climate change risk assessment and that's got to be done every five to six years. We don't know yet. At, uh, and at this stage, we don't know whether it's going to be five years or six years. Um, and there's the national adaptation plan, and that's going to be done every two years. And we're going to be aligning with that. So let's say TA is feeding the information into regional uh, level, and then regional level feeding the information to national level. And then from there, they're going to be, um, I guess, creating a uh, work of stream, what needs to be done. So there is a target. I mean, we cannot avoid from that target. There is a target, um, 2050 target. And there are, let's say, um, maybe one example, there are uh, maybe um, some funding available for uh, transition from the, let's say, um, diesel, petrol car to um, electrical vehicles. And there is some funding available uh, to maybe local TIs. And if we don't have a plan in place, then we, we're less likely to get funding from the central government. So we need to work together with the, in a regional um, uh, framework to be able to let's say, not reinvent the wheel, because we're gonna, we, we have to share, uh, possibly we're going to have to share some um, services, like in the case of regional council, they have, um, they have carried out this regional risk assessment, and that will be feeding into national uh, risk assessment. So there is that synergy that we need to, we need to, we need to use. And I, I, think, I mean, it might be it might be a uh, missed opportunity um, if if I put it in that way, and it allows us to do better planning. Councillor Mitchell. Yeah, I, I guess this is a work in progress too, isn't it? Sure. So I was reading on stuff today that the government's got some carbon cutting ideas out there. And they'll definitely impact on us. So one of them is that they want curbside collection of um, household compost. 
and by 2030, basically no organic waste going to landfills. So that's definitely going to impact us in what we have to do as a council. So there will be changes to this as central government besides what we have to do as well, won't there? Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And there is a there's a plan, um, there's a high level plan that's outlined in this. Uh, what uh, the um, targets are within that part of the carbon, uh, zero carbon. Um, so there's already a plan that's outlined within the Climate Change Commission report. And um, in every sector within the country is working towards it. You know, that, that's, 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 that's mandated. So I think Councillor James. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I think um, Councillor Mitchell's point kind of emphasises for me one of the real issues in this, which is that essentially the Joint Committee focus is on essentially achieving the government's aspirations and targets without providing any corresponding funding necessarily to councils to do that, because so ultimately it's an unfunded, ratepayer-funded activity, right? If, if you want to do something in this space, it requires you to, to, to fund that generally through, it's going to be through ratepayer, ratepayer funding. So, so um, I think you hit the nail on the head, um, Councillor Janice. This, this is something that, um, and it's not unusual, so I, I'm going to be critical when I say this, but this is something that we uh, has been forced upon us um, from Wellington. Um, to actually come under an umbrella um, around this whole um, climate change strategy that's been um, developed. What we need to do as best we can uh, within the resources that are available to us is actually meet our obligations um, from a central government perspective, but um, to not reinvent the wheel because we are 76 different councils doing exactly the same thing. Um, the action plan that's actually been de developed here, whilst it's been targeted for the Horokanua, it's generalised um, with um, the same sort of concepts that's actually being applied um, with other um, other councils. Um, should we um, plagiarise what other people are doing in terms of their sustainability plans? Absolutely. Um, because why reinvent the world? Because they are going to be talking about the same things. One of the things I think is really um, could be helpful for us, though, is to actually have a discussion within council on some of those things that we can do, and I think you've alluded to this, that we can do that... Um, become part of our business um, now. And, and I think I heard you when I was speaking, speaking to you previously about this. Um, things like um, you know, transferring our fleet to um, EVs is something that we can actually do quite easily. It doesn't actually require an action and an action plan. Looking at energy efficiency, um, it should be part of our business that we're actually doing that. Uh, in terms of um, waste minimisation, we've already talked about that, and that's part of that. Uh, and I know there's things like um, compacting bins that we could actually have a look at as well that has an impact on um, our contribution to reducing um, uh, um, uh, you know, gas emissions. I think it would be helpful to actually have a discussion and have a bit of a workshop with the councillors to talk about some of those things that we can do at a local level. There's, um, there's probably also a, 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 an additional part to that from my perspective, which is things that we might like to do but we simply don't have resources to do, so we're not going to do it. Because I understood from that one of the key points of doing this exercise through the Joint Committee is that they then identify gaps, and then they therefore have opportunities for, for fund, central government funding or whatever. So I think it's probably important through this process that we use this as a, as a, as a, a way of saying, yeah, we, we, we have some aspirations and to do different stuff, but because we don't have funding and because there's other important stuff to do, we're just not going to do them unless there's funding or, or some sort of joint solution. Yeah. I, I see also, um, I mean, climate change is just one of those risks that we have to um, mitigate and adapt to just like any risk that we have. So to ignore the fact that climate change is is a discussion uh, would be a dereliction really of our responsibilities um, and not probably a great legacy to leave if we 
to say, well, we can't afford to do that, so we won't uh, do it. We've got a responsibility to make sure that we are uh, part of a solution that does uh, leave um, our environment and our, our, our place in a, in a much better space. Um, you know, I agree completely that it will be centrally government directed and uh, we will have to implement like we do for a lot of central government policies, you know, an unmandated um, sort of policy that we'll have to implement ourselves um, regardless of the cost. So I see this as just really working together as a region in terms of making sure that the things that could impact us are being looked at. I don't think in any way that the language of this um, draft action plan, it talks of um, support, it talks of advocacy, it talks of facilitation, um, it talks of pre preparation and planning. It does not, I don't think, include any um, commitment on our part to make sure that we invest or um, commit. Um, so um, that's why at this stage, um, and I also draw your attention to the point six in the report, uh, which does talk about um, this, th this is only um, an endorsement of the report. There's still a long way to go before we actually sign it off. Councillor Green. Yeah, I'm no, just reacting to uh, Councillor Bishop's words before about um, what are we signing up for. And I'm just, uh, yeah, I have similar concerns in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, but just want to touch on one thing, and that's the, and maybe something Mr. McCorkendale can comment on the relation of. of us accepting this report, or even as a draft again for for engagement, um, the relation of such a report is this as this to the district plan. If you're talking about controlling development, you know we're we're faced currently, as we know, with um, needing development, needing housing. Um, is this report in any way going to add any further layers to what we've already got in our district plan in terms of controlling what's built, where, how it's built? Um, so, yeah, basically, what is the relationship between this plan to the district plan? And if we're looking at changing our district plan, as we talked about and we are, we are doing as part of the work program, making changes to allow for better development, again, what does this impact? Does this report accept this report? If we say, yeah, do this report, it's our, we, we, we buy into everything that's in here. Um, what goes back to that comment, what are we buying into and where does that relationship work? So probably I'll start by saying that the, the district plan and, and changes that we, we currently propose or may propose in the future are all required to take into account climate change. And so regardless of, of this report, that is still something that we have to take into account and commissioners hearing those plan changes, making decisions, will be looking for council to uh, council officers to have duly consider that in their considerations and um, and to provide, I guess, some sort of evidence or, or information supporting uh, where that direction of that report or plan changes is going. Um, and I guess it is also worth pointing out that that climate change space continues to be a space which will evolve um, in light of the, the RMA reform, uh, potentially uh, three pieces of, of legislation that drop out of the ball which could replace the, the current RMA, and one of those is specific to to climate change as well. So it is a space which I think will continue to change and as we sort of advance our plan changes, we're going to have to be cognizant of what's, I guess, the legislation or, or the direction that, that new legislation might take at the time. Um, in terms of this report itself and in its draft form, um, it, it isn't, I guess, directly shaping uh, the plan changes that we're working on at the moment. Obviously, there is um, some direction that this report could could take, and, and with council endorsement, that, that might steer council to, to taking a particular approach with, with future plan changes. Um, but I see that sort of coming in the subsequent sort of conversations and, and pieces of work that might come out of, of this. I think the, the other part is that we, we are a district within a region, and a region, um, issues like climate change don't stop at TA boundaries. Um, so essentially, what we do needs to be sort of thought of in that wider regional context as well, and there'll be um, horizons to play a role in that, and that natural hierarchy of, of local government also will influence what we may end up having to do 
that in terms of responding to, say, what Verizon's might do with the one thing, for instance. Okay, um, could I then uh, take us back to the recommendation on 3.3 on page 41 that Council endorses the draft Tariff for Climate Change Action Plan. Could I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Allen, seconded Councillor Mitchell. Any further debate? Councillor Just a point of clarification. So, um, a draft for engagement or no? It's because I know the question was asked earlier. Sorry, just repeat that. Is this a draft for engagement? And in passing, usually in, within the recommendation, say so. I think the clarification over there earlier was about consultation versus engagement. So, as six um, point six on page. Um, 42 uh, says that um, this will direct officers to proceed to complete iwi and sector engagement, stock take of the council's greenhouse emission, develop and establish a sustainability policy to provide a roadmap to council, and on completion of that, adoption of the final plan and roadmap will be sought from council. Okay. Council Browning. So further to that, um, was, can we outline what sector engagement is? And also, is there going to be an opportunity uh, for us to, I guess, work, workshop it or um, have, have the opportunity to, to delve down into the report there in areas that might concern us prior to coming to Council for adoption? Because I think there's things in here need to be, in my view, need to be at least dis uh, discussed or even tested. Um, short answer but is yes. Okay, and sector engagement? What, what does that mean? Everybody. <laughs> not sure about that. Yeah. So, look, the, the reality is um, we do not have the capacity at the moment to go out and do a full consultation on this. Um, that, that is the reality. And, and if I was honest, if I asked um, my team to actually go out and do full consultation at the moment, I would get a pushback. Uh, what we have to do, I think, is be um, as selective as we can in terms of identifying those people that might have a genuine impact or genuine genuine interest in the discussion around this. Um, we'll define that in terms of who that might be, and if it's, and I can't identify who that might be today, but I'm happy to actually bring that back to council before we actually or indicate to council who that might be uh, before we actually start with that process. But it's not going to happen in the next month. I can tell you right now. Um, yeah, I'll go and accept that, and I don't expect that. I think what would work, in my view, would um, we've got some good again progressive associations and committees that councillors can be involved in with discussions on our area. I'm sure so, so Council Allen will agree. Uh, we have a number of groups that we could sit down and have these discussions with, with perhaps um, some council officers involved to uh, to bring back some 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 views from those communities about some of this things in here that we need to discuss. And, and if we can set up some kind of um, program of having that done, I'd very much encourage it. I, I would actually hope that um, the iwi engagement is actually not done by council. Um, I'm hoping, actually hoping the representatives on the governance group will actually do that on their behalf, um, but take a regional approach to this. And there is representation from Mokoko and from Rakawa um, on that governance group. Councillor Yeah, on page four of the report, it does say that um, engaged communities and businesses, especially those likely to be most affected, iwi, hapu, whanau, coastal communities, producers and growers. So those are the main groups that are going to be affected by this. So it's specific engagement, isn't it? Not, not everybody. Councillor Allen. Yeah, look, um, Mr. Mayor, I, it's been a, it's been a very detailed debate, which is great because um, naturally there are concerns about the devil being in the detail, about the workload implications, about not reinventing the wheel, all those all those considerations. 
I was happy to either move or second. I've forgotten which one I did, the recommendation. Um, but I think implicit in that and following this discussion that we do need to workshop the implications and that that workshop should then lead to a formal report back in the public domain to identify the next steps, where this goes to from here. Because I, I'm support, in, in, in supporting the resolution, I'm supporting the big picture, the, the global aspiration that we need to be a party to, the, to recognise climate change and the part that we have to play in that. How that's done needs to be recognised in terms of a, a detailed workshop about what we can do practically and then that needs, as I say, to come back as a formal report so that the public can see how that will be realised within the limitations of this organisation. So I don't know whether that probably doesn't have to be part of the motion. I think if, if there is support around the table for that as being the next steps, then, then so be it. There would obviously need to be some work done in terms of the logistics of a detailed workshop, but... Um, I, I, I get the tenor of what you're implying and what you're inferring we should do. And in response, Mr Mayor, look, this, this, I'm not seeing this as in any way urgent. I think if we adopt this big picture at this stage, then, then uh, Mr Clapperton will, will, within his work stream, with his staff, identify when that can happen. And personally, I'm relaxed as to the timeline. So, so we can get on a monitoring report because I think this is actually, um, it is a, I, I would prefer a resolution if, and if I could recommend a resolution rather than just an action. Um, so the first one stays as is, but the Council workshops the implications of the Horofanoa Climate Change, uh, the draft Horofanoa Climate Change Action Plan before uh, EV and sector engagement, stock take of Council's greenhouse emissions and development and establishment of a sustainability policy to provide a roadmap to Council. Very happy with that, and with the permission of whoever the other person was, could that be added as an and further to the recommendation? <laughs> Councillor Mitchell, are you comfortable being the seconder of that original motion? I'm just wondering whether you want to workshop before you have EV engagement and sector engagement or after it, once you've actually talked to the main people that are affected, so that can be fed back into the workshop content. I wonder whether we could use in conjunction with, uh, yeah, rather than sort of... Let's leave it as an action, um, yeah. and we'll work through that, and how we might do that, but maybe if we just adopt the first resolution. So, 3.3, Councillor Jennings. I just a point of clarification on that amended motion. It's, it's an addition. It's an addition. Yeah. So, does that mean that following the workshop that would be envisaged, that if there were um, changes required to this document, that that would then be made prior to then there being engagement? So, so I'm not really understanding why we're approving the document as is before we do the workshop. I think the, the, the draft actually allows us as a, to um, have a, a starting point to actually have that discussion uh, with the councillors and, and the, uh, the sector itself. Noting that Based on those discussions, there is the ability to actually change the draft before we actually adopt the final. Now, if we went down the path that I think you're um, indicating, uh, Councillor Jennings, is that um, just depending on the process that we'd have to go through, it would be quite some time before we could actually, um, I suppose, adopt a draft um, on the basis of the feedback that we've actually got from the sector, because it's, it's very unlikely that we'll be doing anything prior to Christmas. We just don't have the capacity at the moment to actually do that. I mean, to, just to be out front with you, I mean, the, my issue is that there are a number of contents in the plan at the moment which just do not sit well with me um, ideologically <laughs> because I, I have bigger questions around whether it's the role of council and yet whether we're essentially, by putting it in here, we're making it our responsibility and then, therefore, we have to find the funding. Um, and there are, there are certain things that 
as I say, I, I just don't think that we should assume that role or responsibility for it. And so I, I have some real difficulty with it as it is, and, and it's only elements, but that's why I, I guess I'd be pushing hard that uh, I think there needs to be some an attempt to consensus build around the contents of it before it then goes out as a, a blueprint for input, because it, it then um, is around whether the direction, whether the, the public agrees with the direction or not. Look, um, we've been nearly an hour on this, and that's, that's, that's fine. <laughs> we've been nearly an hour on this, but that's fine. My, my suggestion is is that we just let this lie on the table for the moment, um, not actually uh, endorse it, but we do agree that we actually have some workshops, bet workshops between now and the next council meeting, so we can actually bring back what... Um, feedback that the, at least the councillors and maybe some key sector, sector members can contribute um, to actually make a, any necessary changes to the draft before we actually finally adopt it. So that would be a suggestion. Just leave it on the table for the moment. Um, have the, uh, the workshops, get some sector, initial um, sector feedback to what's been proposed and then bring it back to the council meeting either in November or December for endorsement. Yes, and look, I, I would be relaxed if that were the, were the decision of the majority of the table, but my, my reading of the document in its draft form is it is very much a high-level document. It, it can, it's about aspirations, followed by specific examples, may, can, could, those words there. So that's why I'm quite relaxed with, with where it sits at the moment, that if if the recommendation or if the motion on the table were to go through, we would be accepting those high level statements involving a commitment to climate change subject to us putting the pegs in the ground of what that looks like in reality and a consultation process. So I, I, I stand by the original motion on the table, but fully accept that as an alternative. What, what it would mean if we were to pass it today is that we've taken the important first step around this council's commitment to making some difference in climate change for the sort of reasons you gave before, Mr. Councillor Kedu. Uh, kia ora, kia ora. Um, yeah, kia ora. 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 So I can see that, you know, there's some of us that are still unsure because uh, I understand the uh, the, the global uh, high level things that need, that are there in this document but there is I can hear um, I can hear that you know there's uncertainty because number one there's I'm hearing from others uh, that there, there, needs to, there needs to be workshop and, and that's what I can hear that's on the table um, so I, I, I agree with um, with us being able to leave it on the table, and uh, as the LC has suggested, so that we can have those other conversations um, on, on the table. Okay. So um, we do have 3.3 on the table. 
And um, so I'm now going to ask for a vote on that. Are you wanting to... I was just wanting to clarify um, whether there's obviously a substantive motion on the table at the moment. And uh, so I was going to suggest a procedural motion to let the, let the matter sit on the table, but we were just discussing whether that is possible while there's a substantive motion on the table. So I um, will put 3.3 that we do. If that is lost, then we will then discuss next steps, which will include the additional resolution to a workshop um, as soon as possible. Okay. So the motion on the table is that Council endorses the draft Horofnoa Climate Change Action Plan. Yeah, can I have a show of hands, please, for this one? Um, all those in favour? It's four against. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the motion is lost. Thank you. Okay, so um, we now then move to the recommendation that was um, put forward by the Chief Executive in terms of workshopping the... In, in so, so I don't think that actually requires a resolution. It's an action. It's um, an action. So we actually have not left the matter lying on the table. It's actually been lost. Um, we have the workshop and then something new will actually be coming back to the next meeting. Or, or the meeting after. Everyone comfortable with that? Okay. Thank you. All right, moving to um, page 57, which is the water treatment plant debrief from the June event. Can I move receipt of this report? Councillor Bishop, second of Deputy Mayor Mason, all those in favour? Against, carried. Uh, welcome the Deputy CE and the um, CE of the Alliance. Welcome, Doe. So, do you want to introduce first, Nikki? Thank you. Kia ora koutou. So, I'm going to start by providing an overview. Um, first of all, an overview of my role, um, why I'm here at the table today, and then uh, a summary, I guess, of, of what you would have picked up in the report. Uh, David, being a technical expert, will provide the technical input because that's clearly not myself. So just to be clear, um, I became involved in this process uh, following the council meeting actually where Councillor Jennings raised some questions with regards to what would be included and what to expect in terms of what would come to the table in a debrief on the water treatment plant side of the response to the June rainfall event. My role at that time was to work uh, with both the HDC operations team and also with the Hotafenua Alliance to actually ensure that what came back to the table had a sense of um, response to the questions asked, but also some clarity around the actions. So I'm going to read to you uh, now my summary uh, that I provided actually to the Chief Executive following, I guess, my involvement in this process. And I think it's important for you to have that information ahead of um, obviously discussing or, or any questions on the report because it may well assist in, in any questions you may have had. So uh, the June weather event was significant, uh, both in terms of the volume of the rainfall but also the turbidity levels that were experienced in our local streams and rivers and the impacts were felt across all of our water treatment plants but in particular in the bin and I think you would have seen that in, in reading the report. What I've gained uh, in terms of my involvement in this process is that the situation in Levin has various layers, uh, and it is really fair to say, and I think it does need to be stated really clearly, that there absolutely have been learnings taken away from uh, what occurred with the event. I want to be clear that the issue was quantity, not quality, uh, and that was also confirmed actually in response to a question that Councillor Jennings uh, asked in regards to some public perception around there being water quality issues. I think it's important to note that it's not uncommon for our plants to be shut down when there are turbidity issues. It is not uh, a one-off event where the Levin plant, which was obviously the plant substantially affected 
uh, was shut down. In fact, that, that would happen, and, it, and hence the report where it talks about the levels in which turbidity becomes a, a factor where the plant would shut down. I think it is very, very important, both for yourselves and for the public who will be listening uh, to this, that that's not an uncommon occurrence. However, the extended period of time experienced compounded the issue in Levin. The note that I provided to the Chief Executive, um, and, and I am reading this word for word, is that it's important that there is um, an understanding that there is shared ownership of contingency plans and communication. And I think it's fair to say that ultimately the better information we have sooner enables us to have the clarity of messaging to the public. And I know it has been raised uh, and discussed that obviously there was some confusion um, that resulted with the communication and, and the time between, um, I guess, the, the reduce and then stop. And I think what I'm saying here is, is we can have fantastic communication uh, and, and send out messages, but if it's not at the right time, then that's going to cause confusion. So I think it's really important um, that that point is, is noted. Uh, the investigations uh, which are underway should all be monitored between HDC and the Horofenua Alliance and progress should be reported into the Chief Executive um, as it is known at the moment we don't currently have a GM of Infrastructure Ops and that can be reported back into the Finance Audit and Risk Committee if Council saw merit in that. I've noted that as the Chief Executive, um, David, I've recommended would be working with his team to ensure that the learnings are put in place and that as the Chief Executive, he's satisfied that the risk has been mitigated accordingly. And why that's important is that there are a number of actions um, and there's also a number of recommendations and learnings to be implemented and I think it's important that that comes back to ensure, particularly around the contingency plan, which does exist for living, However, the um, communication tree and some of the components need to be updated in that. That needs to come back to the Chief Executive to accept um, that that meets his expectations. And I think, uh, obviously, in terms of the investigations, while a number of those will um, and have um, progressed, there will be some components to those investigations that will require subsequent steps and decisions. Uh, so hence the monitoring of those uh, actions and investigations is really important, but equally as is the subsequent decisions that may come from, from any of that work. So that's, I guess, my overview so that you're clear in my role and where I sit, um, the advice I've provided, and obviously how that um, will play into any discussion that you have of subsequent actions or questions to the report itself. Uh, the report was intended to provide some overview of the plants them, themselves and, and I think it was important in looking at the community questions that came through on social media channels. The plants are not identical and I think it's really important that this report outlines at a very high level, and though some of it is technical, um, the difference between each of the water treatment plants and also then specifically where the actions following that event occur and I think it's important to note from my point of view that the learnings I've had work, working alongside this, some of those investigations that have come out were not directly related specifically to the June rainfall event, but they were identified in the debrief because they have a relationship to the, um, maybe the time in which we can respond when there has been you know, a plant shut down due to turbidity levels. And so it's important that they are part of the debrief because they can't be ring fenced out. They were identified, they've been discussed. If there is an opportunity to ensure we can respond quicker to future events, they needed to be incorporated in, in the debrief. That's all from me. Hopefully that provides you with an overview. Obviously David um, has been a significant input to this report and he, um, from a technical point of view, will be able to add um, any further context before it's handed over to questions. I think Nicky's covered, covered the, um, the issues pretty well. I think it's important to note, as Nicky said, that each of the plants is different and each of the plants responds in a different way. You're probably wondering what these four bottles are I've got in front of me here. Just to give you an idea, that is two NTUs. 
which is when the Tokamaru plant shuts down. For most of us, with the naked eye, we would say that it was drinking water. Shannon. Shannon shuts down at 50 NTUs, which is a little bit more cloudy, but it's not significantly different to what you can see here. Shannon is a membrane filtration plant. Tokamaru is a series of filters with no front end, so there's no chemical flocculation or anything occurring as the water enters that plant to knock off the dirty stuff. Levin shuts down at 150 NTUs. That's what 150 NTUs looks like. It's not what you see going down the river as a, as a stream full of mud. This water is pre-filtered by the, by the gravels above the infiltration gallery, so it's that clean or that dirty when it arrives at the plant. This sample here is 500 NTUs, which is the peak during the last, last event, the June event. It peaked at 510. So that's just a guide as to what, what the incoming effluent looks like. It has to be pretty clean to meet the drinking water standards going out the other end. Particularly you know, on, on the smaller plants where you don't have the treatment processes in place. You don't have clarification followed by filtration, followed by UV, followed by chlorination. All of those things aren't in place. The other important thing to note is, on the Levin plant in particular, is that dirty water is not the only thing that can shut that plant down. Um, there are a number of uh, monitoring points through that plant, and if any one of those is exceeded, it will shut the plant down. It could be organic loadings, um, it could be changes in the water makeup, just what's coming into the plant it might look the same, but it could be different. So all of that's picked up by very sensitive equipment and then um, the plant adjusts itself or endeavours to as best it can. Councillor Bishop. Thank you. Um, those samples, David, are taken raw, they're the raw out of the source and yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> I'd imagine you'd have a whole wall for them otherwise. Um, the Levin plant, um, and I want to focus on the clarifier, um, the other plants don't have a front end clarifier like the Levin plant does. So as part of the um, projects committee, I'm thinking six years ago, when we had this conversation about the new water storage tanks up there. And then as part of that piece of work, not as the primary piece of work, because it was the tank, but certainly the sales pitch came on pretty strong that that this piece of kit that came in from China was going to be the wonder machine to take all our headaches away with um, in regards to quality of water and the ability to treat can you just explain to the to the table, please, um, how the clarifier works? Okay. I can't give you a detailed explanation on how it works, but basically what happens, the raw water comes in, chemical agents are added to that to make the, the dirty particles flocculate, and then it filters down through a, some sand layers, before it effectively comes out the other end. That, that's very simplistically how it works. Um, the bit of kit that there is, dare I say, is unique. Um, there are other plants like that you know, throughout New Zealand, but as a standalone piece of kit, it would never produce drinking water, standard water on its own without shutting down, um, well, at this level, or lower. It'll probably be lower than this level, actually. 
So it's a multi-stage process. Thing. Completely understand that. Thank you. So, so the question then remains for me: um, Is that because for me it's about the clarifying? Um, is that clarifier fit for, fit for purpose, or is it, is it working to its capacity? Is it the right size for what we need? Given that we've got increases in our demand, certainly with population, um, have we put the wrong bit of kit in there? And looking back, 2020 vision is great, I know. Um, if you were going to bring to the table a proposal, would, would that clarifier be part of the proposal? That's a question to David. I suppose I'm going to answer this question, clearly not because I'm technical, but because um, that sort of question that you've asked would have to be something that David uh, sits at the table here because he's part of the Hortofino Alliance. HDC, in terms of Hortofino District Council and its infrastructure operations, set a lot of the direction for where council is going and those considerations to plan, and it would be part of MASP, the planning, um, the plan and those requirements. Uh, so I think in terms of your question, I think it would be unfair probably to have David answer that because it would actually involve the likes of Asley who is sitting over there. She may have a slightly different opinion and therefore we could put you wrong as a table if we only provided you one answer. So I think to answer that question, and David, clap it and feel free to chime in here, that would have to be something that I believe the two parties would have to discuss in order to actually put forward for council to consider and answer whether that would be a piece of plan that is fit for purpose, knowing what we know. And I know that in the LTP there is the master planning and, and the pieces of work that have been done around the future of, of um, a number of our assets. So I suppose I'm uncomfortable fully having David answer that question because I don't think it's giving you the full picture is what I would say to that, but feel free, Chief Executive, to jump in there. I just want to add, and this will be my last, is that, and I completely understand, and I know that you put three engineers in a room and you'll get 33 different answers, um, solutions, you know. But what I'm saying is that, and I'm happy to be proved wrong in those six, you know, whatever years ago, it was a long time to, to try and claw back from your memory of actually what it was, and I'd like to see what that report was. But we were sold a solution. And this is, again, we are politicians who are charged by our community to make decisions based on what evidence we've given. And I, I cannot uh, let this report go through without saying that we were told that this is the solution. And you know up here the history of the number of times we've been told there's lots of solutions. And it's really disappointing that, that we're in this spot looking down the barrel of a piece of kit that's probably questionable whether it's actually fit for us. Councillor James. Look, um, just a brief comment and then a question if that's okay. Um, just, a, a, I guess, a, a first a thank you to the Deputy Chief Executive and the Chief Executive for um, uh, responding being so responsive with my questions and uh, my focus on this particular issue. Um, right from the beginning of, of when the event occurred, I guess my interest was to understand the risk of this reoccurring, the, the, the specific circumstances of, of June. And, and I'm, I guess I'm assured that... I feel assured that there's been a number of learnings taken from the event and that there are corrective actions that have either already been taken or are, will be taken. Um, and I think, um, certainly listening to Councillor um, Bishop, you know, potentially there's some further discussion around um, what we need to look at in, in terms of actually managing that ongoing, or those ongoing turbidity issues and, and, and actually understanding the impact of them and, and, and you know, potential for, for future uh, disruption to supply. Um, but I guess I just wanted to focus on, you, you answered about, well, preempted about um, you know, 20 of my questions, so uh, thanks for doing that. Um, but um, 
one of the things that was covered in the previous report at the previous council meeting about the response to the event, there was a comment in there about um, that there was a lack of contingency planning. And then in this, and, and that alarmed me at the time, and so I, I sort of asked some questions around that. And then in this report, it does talk about there being contingency plans in place, um, but that obviously there needs to be some updating of that. And I just wondered if you wanted to take the opportunity to clarify, I guess, what the difference in reference to contingency plan across those two reports uh, was, just so that there's no confusion around uh, what was actually being referred to in, e in each report, if that makes sense. Thank you. So just to be really clear, um, when we talk about contingency, I think where some of the confusion occurs here is there's Kōrowhanau District Council contingency planning, and then there is contingency planning as it refers to the Horofenua Alliance and any of the plant in which the Horofenua Alliance um, is responsible for. And obviously it's in the interest of both of those parties to be clear on that contingency planning and Horofanoa District Council feeds into that contingency planning as does then the Alliance feeding back. I wasn't part of um, the debrief itself with the IMT, um, but what I can say is there is a contingency plan for Levin in which the Horofanoa Alliance currently is responsible for uh, and that is the plan that needs to be updated. I think the missing link is that plan, and hence my recommendation to the Chief Executive, needs to be a plan that is accepted and owned equally by Horofenua District Council. Uh, so whether the confusion came about because of looking, does HDC hold a contingency plan? Actually, Horofenua Alliance holds a contingency plan for that plan. So I'm satisfied there is a plan, I was obviously not satisfied that the plan can stand as it does because we already know that some of the failure sat within the, the call tree there um, and obviously the industry notification and those components. So that needs to be updated and tabled back into the Chief Executive and then needs to be accepted by Hortonville District Council as to if that meets the expectations as with any other plans that exist on any of the other plants. Thank you, David. Thank you, Nikki. And um, can I have those samples? Can we keep those? Because I think they'd look quite good on my back wall. Um, so just to understand and some of the, and to also highlight, um, I think some of the, the comments that have been made around um, what, you know, some work that may need to be done. Um, I also note in the, um, report that there are a number of investigations that will continue into the future. So I'm sure um, the table will look forward to uh, receiving some uh, feedback at, at a future date, either through FAR or uh, on a monitoring report that um, we will be um, assured that those investigations are carried on. May I just add through your worship, I will pick up on Councillor Bishop's comment and ensure that the clarifier is factored into that in terms of that discussion as well, because obviously that's not currently within the report. Thank you. Um, one of the other situations that this event did highlight was the impact of the incident management team in terms of its response and the way that it dealt with the issue. Um, they did step up quickly and very effectively to uh, manage the situation and also the relationship that they had with um, Horizons and NEMA enabled that alert to be, um, to be distributed through um, um, the, our phone system and things like that, which was, in the end, uh, the critical thing that made the, the difference in terms of managing that water solution problem. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, all those that were part of that team um, that did make that impact. David, I'm sure um, you've learnt a lot and um, um, we look forward to um, the Alliance, um, you know, and the future reports that, you know, we uh, will see, no doubt, uh, coming up. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, just, just a crap point of clarification. Will, will this be added to the monitoring report or it will be? Okay.
So that brings our meeting to a close. And um, yeah. see that. Councillor Kedu, could you please do the honours and formally close the meeting? Thank you. Tēnā koutou mō te kōrero wānana e pāne ki te tātou take me te wānana ki a mātou ngā kaita ki o te rohi nei tā tēnā koutou kai mahi Mickey and David and Ashley and Tēnā koutou o tō awhina mai ki a mātou ki te whakamāra mārama tia tō tātou kōrero e pāne ki kaupapa nei tēnā koutou. Yeah, just saying that thank you for our officers that are giving us the information to be able to help us to make good decisions on our table. And also thank you to all of us who have been here today to be able to, you know, have these discussions uh, to make better decisions for our community. Kia ora tātou. E te atua kāharawa, kia tau, kia tātou katoa, te atua whai tō tātou riki ai hō koraiti, e te aroha o te atua me te whipuna tai tanga, ki te wai hua tapu, āke, āke, āke. Amen. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora, Robin. Thank you. Clean meeting closed.